Let's give them something to talk about. I see the energy running out. I got a planet to run around. Okay, okay. You ain't do nothing but run your mouth. No, I don't want to be humble. Yeah, dude, that was smooth. That was good. PR. Best one. <laughs> Um, hey, so welcome, Mather. Glad to have you here. Thanks. Glad yeah. to be here. This is exciting. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's for those who don't know, we've known Mather for um, ten, 10 years. years. Now. Ten years now. It, it, it's actually kind of cool that this is like almost a ten year anniversary. Kind of is. Well, yeah. it is a ten year anniversary of the of our team, the the National Pro Grid League team, yeah. the San Francisco Fire, because we got started in two thousand fourteen. That's right. Yep. And right, and well, and we were really close. No, our first match was in August of, I want to say August of two two thousand fourteen, was our first match we had. Yeah, but we're very close to that date, which is really kind of cool. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. It is. And we would have had a reunion with everybody that was involved, but everybody's too bitter. <laughs> There's some bitterness. Uh, <laughs> we'll do it. We're, we'll work on a twenty year reunion. <laughs> <laughs> but then we'll all have forgotten. Ah, oh, fuck it. <laughs> bring it back <laughs> yeah but it's it i'm super stoked to have you on and and we're doing this for on for a couple of reasons one we jamie and i have to be, be honest with you jamie and i have talked about doing this for a while while now because grid comes up here and there in conversations especially with crossfitters mm -hmm. and uh and you guys at the united grid league now are starting to really gain interest in and amongst the community like it's come you know well we're all the way over here in california we're starting to see tons of mm -hmm. content coming from your direction interest from our athletes and our community about what it is what's this all about and you know i find myself every once in a while well let me tell you about it. we help start that <laughs> that sport <laughs> i get all defensive you, you, th these guys yeah they're good but let me tell you about how we got started <laughs> And so it's it's fun. To, so we've been wanting to do something like this. We've also and and I, you know, again, we, I, Jamie knows. I tell him every once in a while, hey, maybe we should, mm -hmm. and 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 think about putting something together because it was. Uh, and and I just I'm gonna start this podcast and end it the same way. <laughs> it was so much fucking yes. fun. Yes. It uh, it was there was no, all of it too. Yeah. All of it from from the pros to the amateur stuff that we were yeah. doing back in the day when there was like that in between year, it was it was so much fun. Yeah, it, it was fun. The, the The events were fun. The athlete relationships were fun, and I think every athlete that participated in, if you went back and talked to them about it, they'd be like, "Oh yeah, that was really cool." Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, yeah there's so few there's so few things you do in life that you'll just always remember and cherish. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I feel like there's very few people from that experience that don't really, really cherish at least portions of it. Of course, like you said, there are some bitterness components to it, but sure. anything worth doing has challenge and emotion associated with it. So mm. um, yeah. well said. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's so true too. Cause like even throughout the cross the years of the last decade running into, you know, past teammates or past competitors from, from those days and at the CrossFit games or at local competitions, it's like, Hey, it's like, Oh yeah. We have our, such a good throwback. Dude, we have a secret handshake. Yeah. <laughs> we know, <laughs> we know. And we just, we just like, mm -hmm. yep. great speed. Let's do it. <laughs> yep. So, um, so for those who don't know, Mather, um, was part of the original, uh, grid league, uh, which was the national pro grid league. And we'll talk about that, the original National Pro Grid League. I think it's important for people to understand that this didn't start like on a just on a whim. There was a mm -hmm. tremendous amount of thought and a massive investment that was put in, into it uh, to try and truly make it a professional sport. It wasn't with it wasn't trying to sensationalize it or try to get it on just get it on TV and and collect. It was truly an effort to try and create a new American sport. Um, Tony Budding, uh, who was a former media director of CrossFit, really had a big vision for it. A lot of reasons why it didn't work out. Um, but what's really cool is that one of the team founders, um, Mather Wiswell and his sister, That's right. Ruby, um, who owned the Miami Surge, mm -hmm. um, after the completion of the National Pro Grid League, kept it going. And, he, and they kept it going in an amateur format, something that they started while you were, had the, owned the pro team, right? 
Barely, but yes, the last mm-hmm. year of the pro team was when we held our first technical event. It did. It, it looked nothing like it does now, um, but yeah, that was the technical start of it for sure. Was that right after Provo or like during that time? Like it's actually during. We were planning okay. the event in Provo and held it directly after Provo. Okay. I believe. So, so just to give cool. yeah. just to give people points of references, Jamie, be yeah, careful. Sorry. <laughs> Provo means something to us. It means <laughs> nothing to anybody that's listening to this podcast or may listen to this podcast. <laughs> Provo, Utah, was the last season of uh, the Grid League in 2016 Mm -hmm. and what was interesting about that it was an attempt that something that should have been done sooner Mm -hmm. we realized um because what it allowed they they essentially came together for three weeks in provo utah at a at a a month yeah was it a month at at a convention center there to essentially run and film the entire season yeah giving the league tremendous cost savings is they didn't have to move media equipment or gym equipment all around the country to different venues set up in different venues. The whole thing, you could leave the venue set up Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then record the entire season, much like they do with American Ninja warrior, Mm -hmm. which does it, which, you know, for those that don't understand what, um, what an amazing event American Ninja Warrior is. It's highly watched. It's, it's, you know, for many, many years in the top in Nielsen ratings. What's cool about them is that their production costs are exceptionally low because they do it outdoors. They don't have to rent a venue. They're doing it outdoors on an empty lot in Las Vegas. Mm, yeah. Um, they have everything, all their equipment stored there. They do the same thing. They run their season very quickly. I'm not sure what their season length is. I think it's something like three weeks, but they're doing, you know, they're operating every other night kind of thing, or maybe even every night during that. So everybody's there the whole time. Everybody's there the whole time for us. Yep. And they, and they actually do the stages there as well, which is really with some of the stages there as well. But what's cool about it is because it's outdoors, they wait until nighttime when it's dark, Mm -hmm. which gives them the, like the feeling of being indoors with the lighting fun vibe for the TV. It's just the whole thing's, brilliantly done yeah, like yeah. at a at an exceptionally low cost and and the grid league the national pro grid league tried to mimic that with their events in provo utah um and unfortunately um essentially ran out of money um and and couldn't continue on didn't have the tv contracts didn't have the support and we could talk about that but you so you started your uh what was with then was the florida grid league right Correct. Yeah, it was originally meant to support, like the original vision of it was going to support the Miami Surge Mm. through kind of regional engagement to better educate the sport, find athletes, things like that. And then, of course, when the NPGO went down, it it evolved into something different, which is essentially the the pinnacle of the sport, but in a very, very different model. And it was the Florida Grid League a... Um, self-funded league, meaning it was oper- it could operate without extra cost input. Yes, completely ba- bootstrapped. Wow. Yep, the whole way. And um, let's 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 take a step back and ha- have people understand because we're going to get you know a lot of California listeners understand what grid is, mm-hmm. um, and then we'll go from there. Um, the, and then I'll just kind of interject because I could get into the history of it really in deep detail, but I'm not sure everybody wants to hear that. But it was started in. It, I'll give a brief. I'll give a brief intro, and then we can t- let's talk about how the the matches are set up and the field is set up. Jamie's got a picture of the of the grid. Mm-hmm. Um, 2000 end of 2013, toting budding. Um, after coming off a very successful international team competition, um, in Berlin, it was a sold out event. The invitational, um, correct? Yeah, the invitational. Yeah. It was uh, the team invitational. Filled up and sold out an arena within like three hours. Um, the broadcast of it itself, like the recordings they did it for like YouTube, was just it was it was awesome, and people were in all and were awestruck by it. And I remember him telling us about being in the in the TV trailer and just looking at the people watching it who n- have no experience with CrossFit or um, ever. Just were looking at just going, "What the hell? This is amazing!" Yeah. Mm-hmm. He formulated an idea then that, you know, hey, let's create a team sport based on that invitational, CrossFit Invitational, Team Invitational, International Team Invitational, much like we've seen recently. 
and where strategy is involved and people can t see who's winning and losing those types of things. So they, um, uh, so from there he, he asked and pitched it to CrossFit, uh, to Greg Glassman. It was, and was turned down. It's not so Greg was not in support of it, you know, investing in any more competition competition events competition stuff yeah yeah and uh, so he basically wrote a jerry Maguire email which uh, in hindsight that probably wasn't the best idea but you know again it's you know it's he was pissed and so he basically left to start this league got some funding from his family mm -hmm. um a fairly substantial amount of money from his family and then attempted to recruit um some of the key individuals from crossfit some of them came many of them did not and it was that was perceived in my opinion as a th threat to crossfit by crossfit in other words it was perceived as a competitive threat mm -hmm. um that started the whole process of kind of competing with crossfit um he left um he reached out to me at that time and said hey can, what do you think about this idea i was you know coming out the crossfit games myself as a master's athlete Diablo was crushing a competition. Team, Cross, competition, uh, yeah. competition was like, we were all about it. So I'm like, this is awesome. More team events. We love team. And so I went and met with them. And then we helped, I helped them build the website, which was the National Pro Fitness League. The NPFL. Yeah. The NPFL. Where we had the original combine and right. draft. And he hated the word fitness. He hated the word fitness. What was it? Um, in, in what's that? What do you mean he hated fitness? T Tony hated the word fitness in the uh, describing the oh, sport. Oh, 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 yeah, in the in the label. In the yeah, in the label. Yeah. He hated the word fitness. So he, but that wasn't why he changed. It was one of the reasons why he changed. But the other reason was his attorneys that had helped right. him set up the rule book and the league itself, the league structure with the contracts for the athletes. This is, this is not just a, it was deep. This is not an event. This is a very complex, like a, uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent on legal fees. To establish yeah, this, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and so they advised him, hey, look, the logo itself, and if you show the National Pro Grid League um, label, let me bring bring back up that uh, banner, Jamie. It was just up. Which banner? The banner that we just used. Oh, the banner. Yeah. Stand by. I'm um, staging so, our so, other stuff. So if you look at the banner that's um, that we have, you see the MPGL. That was MPFL. That's right. And it looked a lot like Ooh. it basically looked a lot like the NFL's logo. And so the NFL logo. Um, so they the attorneys advised, look, you get you need to change the name. So he so what did Tony do? He contracted a marketing firm in San Francisco. Um, those guys were great, and they came up with the term grid. Mm -hmm. What's that? What are you showing? MPFL. Oh, you got an MPFL yeah, logo. Yeah, this that's what I mean. This is from the finalists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, MPFL. Yeah. Wow. That's there a collector's go. item. A little throwback for you. So they changed uh, They changed it from the National Pro Fitness League to Grid. And because we were playing on a grid. Mm -hmm. And the, what's cool about the Grid logo, put that banner back up again, if most people don't understand this. And uh, do you use, you don't use this Grid logo. No, we haven't. We probably should, honestly, but we haven't. It's a sick logo, too. Well, it's a sick logo because it's a, what is it, an anagram? Is that what they call it? I think so. Wait, I think so, yeah. Down. yeah, so you flip it upside down, and it says the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, you know, there's some, you know, hey, okay, yeah, you're going out, right? And, and then you can substitute, which means you can go back and substitute. And then he created rules for the sport, um, and, you know, he... It just, I, I swear I wasn't going to get too deep on this. Sorry, Mather. It's all good. <laughs> I'm very re revisiting but, this. So this book, he recommended. He recommended I read this book. And and anybody that's in professional sports, I think Dave Castro's read this book as well. Dave knows this book, Sports Illusion, Sports Reality, Leonard Coppett. And it's basically in it, it. It outlines like how you build, how professional sports were built and came and basically came into popularity. But there were seven components that Tony was really adamant about that the sport had to have. Comprehensibility. So be, be, people, and all that means is people need to under, look at it and understand what they're doing. Mm -hmm. the, and the more comprehensible it is, the more likely people are to kind of become engaged with it quickly. And that was what was really cool about the grid format, say, versus CrossFit. You know, you walk into CrossFit, although Dave has now said this many times, I want people to walk in <coughs> and see, look at it and see who's winning and... Mm -hmm leave come back and be able to tell again 
um, continuity. In other words, it needs to be the same from week to week. So what Tony created one, he created the grid. So you, you move basically move down the grid as you accomplish things. Um, and then the first person to the end of the grid, two teams going against each other wins. So it's as simple as that. Continuity means every week you, you can, you can experience the same thing. Yeah. And so he created consistency between races. Yeah. Race so he, formats. Yeah. Race formats. So there was, so there was n nine races, 11. In, oh, that's there 11 <laughs> races in a match. Sorry. Okay. Look, <laughs> I was not a coach. First of all, <laughs> no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I help with the overall stuff. <laughs> Um, yeah, and jump in anytime, Mather. Tell me how long. I am. <laughs> but what's cool is race one was race one, like, and, and it was a certain format. Um, Jamie Mather, tell me, do you, what are some of the race races one through eleven that people like, so that people can understand what we mean by that? Do you want to go, Mather? Yeah. So I mean, the the main thing in consistency is the the rules around how the races are run and and like what's a legal move and what's not are mm -hmm. consistent from match to match. Yes. And that really creates like a very, you know, con continuous experience, like, like that book says. And, yes. um, we have maintained all of the races that existed, except we made, did make a couple of changes, um, which we could talk about, but, uh, what but number, like, what number is the ladder? 11. Is, is, oh, the ladder, no, uh, seven, right? It, I believe it was seven. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually six race for seven. us. Do you, okay. It's race six for you guys. So the seventh race was a, always a ladder. There's some sort of ladder, a barbell ladder that, or well, and it could even be dumbbell ladder. It could be, but it, it gets progressively harder as you move down uh, the the quadrants. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, and that just the, the, that's one of the funnest events there is, and and. And so it continuity from so everybody knows, right? It it you know that was watching grid. Hey, race seven is the ladder, you know, and 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 that made it fun as hell. There was it's got to be readable, or in other words, people will need to know the score. Well, one thing that Tony invested in, remember the technology they invested in was the scoreboard. And I'll pull and, up a picture of that. Yeah, and they had a scoreboard up. So when you're sitting in the arena, you could watch the athletes and tell where they were on the grid, but you yeah. could also see the team scoreboard and the number of reps they were doing. And it was like a bar chart and it was so badass. So you see that, um, it's if you kind of hard to can see, you, can you zoom in on this? Let me see if I can. Jamie's not like, yeah, there you go, dude. Right on. Look at you. Winning. All right. So, so right at the top, um, so you see the grid and then you see the grid logo in the middle. This was a beautiful one. And by the way, that's an Aleco rig. Amazing um, piece of equipment. Amazing piece of equipment designed for grid and uh, shipped out to us. Um, but there's that bar chart. And, and that bar chart basically shows it's a zero, zero score, but that's counting the reps. So the, it, the, the reps of each team, and if they're equal, right, it, it, you know, it stays, it looks like that, but as they add points, or in this case, this, reps is, the, ahead. this is a ladder, it shows you where they are and you watch and the fans would go nuts. So fun watching watch. that stupid bar chart. <laughs> and when you see that bar chart, like crossover, you look it up, look it down, they look up, look it down, look it up, look it down. It was so freaking exciting. Um, so readability, coherence, and then oh, here's the here's number five is hazard, and and the 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 sport itself. And you think about football, baseball. There's a, there's a little bit of hazard in all of these sports, even soccer, right? There's a little bit of danger, a little bit of hazard. Yeah, and that 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 keeps uh, fans engaged as well. And of course, grid has that. You know, <laughs> with some of these events, low cost. We didn't do well on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Big right out of the gate. Holy crap. <laughs> we had eyes way bigger than our stomach. Um, and then uh, a vicarious experience, violence, triumph, second guessing, and patriotism. And and we did have some team. It was what was really cool that happened here and why I have such long lasting relationships with people um, like Mather, like Dusty Highland, LA Rain, mm -hmm. and like Justin Kotler at the Brawlers mm -hmm. and, uh, and Josh. Oscar. Oscar at the Boston Iron is that there was this this patriotism with our teams. Yeah. Yeah. Like we were passionate about, you know, we would talk shit. That was so fun. About Kotler and the <laughs> and the brawlers. It was kind of almost heated, but it was rivalry really action. good friendships developed yeah. as a result yeah. of that. It yeah. was so freaking cool. And when the uh, you know, when there was an upset, it was so awesome. 
when when someone beat if someone beat the powerhouse team or even mm -hmm. beat them on a race, a race that they always win yeah. yeah it just was was outstanding and then the other thing that happened that was really cool and then i'll then let's get into this a little bit is there were some heroes that were made in the sport there were some athletes that became kind of iconic because of their performances in a particular event specialties specialties yeah. sam dancer diving across yeah. the the finish line at the event at uh, yeah, berkeley the at, the, at the haas pavilion in our event to win the to win the event someone doing a huge lift in the fourth quadrant mm -hmm. or hitting that touch okay. and go at that final bar yeah. and the ladder yeah or, or not the ladder the uh the, the race 11. yeah race 11. and ra so race 11 this was a cool one because race 11 had a combination of gymnastics right and then mm. the last had all kinds of stuff the last quadrant was always wasn't the last quarter always generally a, like a really heavy item generally really heavy item and you would see this fast and furious effort going on um through the first three quadrants in the last race and, and a lot of, of matches came down to that last race mm -hmm. and then and but the last event of the last race was you so oftentimes a heavy clean and jerk mm -hmm. or a double clean heavy and jerk snatch. something like that heavy snatch and the athlete what you would think is, you know, in this fast and furious, the gymnastics, muscle ups, everything else, that the last athlete would come just barreling down that quadrant to do that lift. And oftentimes it was a slow jog, yeah. sometimes almost a walk up to the bar as they're trying to prepare themselves to go from lifting fucking nothing yeah. <laughs> to cleaning and jerking. <laughs> like, I forget some of the stuff, more than 315. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and like you're, you're like, walking up and you got Danny Nichols sprinting up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he didn't slow down. No, we yeah, there's a, gas there, pedal. There's some, yeah, there you go. Right. So there's a hero, right? Danny, yeah. Danny Nichols yeah. would come and we would send our athlete. Our athlete would get to the barbell first of all, all the other stuff, hit one rep, yeah, and then you know, have to take a step back, and go, Ooh, and Danny Nichols comes up and freaking you know, touch and goes it and yeah. wins the race because. They or can't. or you're down and then you have somebody like eric cardona come in and, right. and rip out some gymnastic stuff and like yes. get us five reps ahead out of nowhere yeah there was just so exciting stuff there was so many really exciting stuff and the crowd got it and understood it and it was passionate um tell me now so um, just real quick we so we had on our team when we first started um we i don't know how many total athletes we had but the, yeah. each race was um, was it eight men, eight women? Was it eight and eight to start when we five started? Five and five. Five and five. Okay, but one had to be a masters, correct? Yeah. Initially. Or, Initially. Oh, so the the total team or within a given race? Because the total well, with, team, I think, was always eighteen, if I remember. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it was eight, eight, eight and eight. But then you would start the five and five. Then right. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you you would start five men and five women. Because mm -hmm. when we say five and five and and four and four, it's five men, five women. And but each race would only have um, two or four, depending no. on two, because there was also like the uh, no, there was four for the mirror. Oh yeah, 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 right. So four athletes would be out there for the mirror, two men, two women. Well, you'd have you'd have six in the you'd mirror because you'd have, you'd have, you'd have oh, six in the mirror. That's okay. right, because two people carrying the bar. Yep, right, exactly. Right. So let me let me just uh, and you guys help me here. Yeah, but, but you, you, so, you but, keep you keep referring to quadrants you want to talk about the grid really quick just to kind of lay out yeah, the we, floor yeah, plan yeah we do that real quick yeah we'll pull up that um, so the mirror race was essentially you, the barbell can't touch the ground once it leaves the floor it can't touch the ground if it touches the ground all athletes have to run back to the starting point touch the ground behind the line then come back out and re-go and there's a certain number of reps so so for example a shoulder over you can put that put that piece up i'll talk um and yeah, so there's the four quadrants, right? So you you come out and and then they and they were there's a certain number of reps in each lane, right? So ten and I think in the shouldered overhead it was like 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 yeah. And it was a heavy weight yeah. for men and women. And they had to do it at the same time. Like you one couldn't the two women couldn't get ahead of the men. Yeah. And or the one you, woman you, you could finish on within the quadrant, but yeah. you could move on without the athlete that's doing the shouldered overhead couldn't um they had to mirror each other, mm -hmm. right? At the same time. What was cool was you had two athletes holding the bar as and human moving, racks, yeah. Uh, yeah, as human racks, moving from quad to quad. So, th so they'd let the athlete do it. Then they would, you know, do the ten reps. Ten reps get done, and then they move to the next quadrant and they go again. The athletes could swap out mm -hmm. 
So in which they would, right? Because it was strategically, you want to move the bar, then swap the athlete out and let the fresh athlete that was holding the bar go. And you just get, and if the bar dropped at any point, it slipped and dropped, all four athletes had to go back, which gave a huge advantage. All six athletes. Yeah, all six athletes, sorry. Uh, three and three, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so there's three men, three women on yeah. each side. Sorry. But just to, and, and they'd move all the way down, and then they get to the fourth quadrant. These guys are all smoked, and you definitely did not want to drop that barbell in the fourth quadrant. Because if you drop the fourth quadrant, you got to go all the way back to the start, tag, and come all the way back. And that's, you know, three, four reps. For, as, a, as a reference, too, the, the barbell for the overhead was like a 285, I think. For the guys. It was a heavy. For the men. Oh, yeah, it yeah. was a heavy bar. So you had to have <laughs> yeah. some heavy specialists, some heavy yeah. hitters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are so are you guys doing the what are your guys' events or what are your guys' notable events that you guys are running in your United Grid League? We kept all the same races. The main differences, there's there's actually three main differences in the race structures. Yeah. Uh the first one is the ladder, we reduced the number of barbells mm -hmm. and increased the weight generally of of the like total barbell width. Cause he, they, if you remember, they used to start out with really light, light weights. Yes. And people just kind of rip through them and throw the barbell everywhere. And, and so we kind of eliminated oh, yeah. that, got a little heavier from Good the get go idea. and had four and four instead of, uh, so there's four men bars and four women bars. So that's one okay. difference. The next difference is we combine the echoes. One of the consistent right. pieces of feedback that we got was that four echoes in a row was just too many of the same mm -hmm. thing back to back to back. So we combined men and women together in the echoes and um, in the strength elements, they share the same strength implement. It's just, uh, there's a variation on what the element is. So for example, females will deadlift a bed the, um, the bar to accumulate reps and guys will clean it. Oh, uh, okay. So not having to have multiple pieces of equipment out there then. Yeah. So, the, and they share equipment, yeah. which is completely yeah. oh, unique. That's to a great us. idea. Yeah. yeah. That's a huge win. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the echo was, I think races five and six. It was the, three, four, five, and six. Three, four, five, and six. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the issue was the same thing, four races in a row. So you consolidated it down to, to two. two races. Two. Okay. Yeah. So an echo is basically you do the race and then you do the same race again. It's a, exactly. essentially four elements, right? One element per That's quadrant. Right. That's right. Okay. We kept that whole structure in the way that, you know, it's often strength, body weight, body weight, strength, mm -hmm. that kind of general structure. We kept all of that is just combining men and women. Got it was it. That, cool. the, like the that. echo. Was, so now, and then here's what you got to think about as a coach and why the coach is so freaking important in grid, which is really neat is they have to think about keeping fresh athletes out there mm -hmm. the whole time. So now you got a team of, you know, in, in, when we had grid, it was you know a team of what we say eighteen athletes, and you got a uh, you but five ball, starting, but you can ten only start, starting, yeah, ten you can only start. That's right. So you got a team of ten athletes, and you got to cycle those athletes in and out so that you get the freshest athletes. What was really cool, I do remember with echo, the echo races, is a team would win, dominate mm -hmm. one echo, and yeah. then lose the next one. Yeah, because they're reusing that athlete for the thirty muscle ups or something like that. Yeah, that still happens all the time. Oh, it, those oh, echoes man. flip all the time, and, that and is, yeah, that's cool. It's yeah. just really wild when that happens. Like, and you're looking at just going, wait a minute. And, yeah. and that's part of the strategy and then the part of the endurance. That's cool. Yeah. And good race design is for that. Like you're trying to achieve where you have to make a changes or you, if you try again with your best athletes, because every team has somebody that's going to be the best at a certain element. Mm -hmm. So if you take the risk and try again and they mess up, that's it. It's over. Or you switch it out for somebody that's not quite as good then, you know, that has a different outcome than the first one. And therefore, you know, and, and of course, as with any grid race, one mistake can mess every piece of your strategy up and completely flip what the, the race outcome is. So all of that combined means that that echo does flip quite often. We would score the races. So a win was worth one point, right? Or was it two, two points? points. Right, okay. Win was two points. Completion was one. Completion of the event and losing is one point. Mm -hmm. And then completion or, and then, Lose, non losing zero. and non not completing is zero do you guys still follow that same format absolutely yeah i mean that's that's yeah. one of the secrets to that the the scoring structure and tony had great vision for that for sure um, yeah that worked they added the zero feature um 
I after, think that was in there. that was added. That was a late ad. That was, was after it? like Florida. That was after the initial uh, tests in Florida. Was it that was that was where our draft was? He added yeah. that. He added that after the fact. Yeah, and that, I remember him getting resistance for that. But yes, it, so it absolutely critical to you know the races keeping tension even when one wins, and even the scoring overall. It just it, it equates to a much better product for sure which did it, did it put on like a, a timer too like you had x amount of yes. time to finish it yeah yes there that was the shot clock that came that's, in okay, later that's, on okay, that's what i'm thinking of okay yeah. um, we we would love to do that we don't have the technology for yeah. it but we do have time caps um and then the the, the only we we did add one race we added one new race mm. and it's called the ringer point race and essentially the team picks so one of the big issues with the original version of grid in our mind that we always talked about was that there's no defense and there's no interaction between the teams. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why does it even matter that you're playing a specific team overall? You could just, you know, have everybody run the race and then compare times. And we wanted to create an opportunity for one team to be able to affect the other team's performance. And so we introduced the ringer point race which is a race selected by the teams. So there's like a set list of races oh. and, uh, and each team picks one. So you're going to pick one that you think you have an advantage of, of over the other team. And it involves one player. So that's why it's called the ringer mm -hmm. point players. So it's like your, your ringer for that particular race. But you can only use a player once in a season. So this gives an opportunity for teams to strategically affect one another um, and then also you have to, you know, incorporate your season long planning mm -hmm. with your roster with those with the, that race. So that was like the only thing that we've done differently from a race perspective. But that specific race has a shot clock involved. So the score, the way the scoring works is it's the, still the two and one. But instead of a regular time cap, it's 20 percent of whatever the winning time was. So it's the shot clock reversed. Or the same idea as the shot clock. We just don't have the technology to have the countdown the way that we did on the screen in, yeah. in the NPGL. Um, do, how does your okay? So the grid league was set up essentially with team owners. So, you know, Tony Budding um, essentially uh, built the league, mm -hmm. hired professional referees. I remember. I remember did, you guys. We were all kind of part of the rule book, yeah. uh, crafting the rule book, and it was an extensive rule book. Um, he created professional documents by the same law firm that uh, that actually represented the NFL. They mm -hmm. created they created the contracts of the team owners that the team owners had with the league, and then they created the athlete contracts that the athletes had with the the teams with the teams and and everybody. It was it was a and we were there and the athletes were employees. And one of his visions was, look, I want to make sure I want to get these CrossFit athletes more money in their pocket. I want to get them paid. Mm -hmm. And so we paid them salaries mm -hmm. to, to, and then there were bonuses as well, but we paid them salaries to, to, to be on the teams. Um, Jamie, by the way, was a San Francisco fire athlete. And Jamie also, not only that, but he also helped organize and run the, you know, one of our, uh, was it the only, the only, uh, we did one, um, amateur, amateur event, one, amateur one or two. Event. Yeah. I yeah. Had, we hosted one at the training facility. Yeah. It was like a local competition, local yeah. tournament where we did like, I think five or six races. Yeah. Um, just and that was watered a lot of, way that, down. And that was a lot of fun. Oh, the, it was so much fun. So, um, we, so the grid league has these contracts with the, the, the owners and the owners have contracts with the employees. It was all very, it was very formal. This was, you could tell the money wasn't. And we went and did the events. Like we did a, we had a professional draft. Mm -hmm. The pro days. food, the hotels, like the whole thing was just big money stuff. They had pro days where we had try combines where the athletes came in and tried out the whole hours. How does that differ from what you guys are doing in United Grid League or Florida Grid League into United Grid League? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've made reference a couple of times, but the overhead associated with that version was not sustainable. No. It didn't really matter what the income was. It just wasn't going to match it anytime soon and i think there's a reason like you still hear about uh contract issues and you know things about like our athletes paid enough in the ufc and that's like one of the biggest sports in the world good point and there's a reason for that and it's because you know what you pay your staff and what you pay your athletes are the biggest levers you can pull as far as overhead goes 
and um, and of course travel, as Craig also mentioned earlier as well. So uh, rather than you know kind of get out of ahead of ourselves, like clearly NPGL NPGL taught us uh, you know what not to do in that regard. Yes, we kind of reversed it to all right. What is the more traditional amateur version of you know the opportunity to make finances a part of being an athlete? And initially, it was exclusively through the prize that's won for the season. Um, you know, we kept it all regional in Florida so that the the cost to be an athlete were a lot lower. And if you're going to go compete in a local CrossFit competition, you could also go compete in grid and obviously have a much better, more organized and, you know, mm-hmm. exciting experience that feels very different, in our opinion, better. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Um, but uh you know, as we've grown, we've figured out opportunities for players to earn by being a player in different ways, but it also directly correlates to their effort, both uh, for the brands that end up paying them, but also in promoting the sport and their team and Mm -hmm. things like that. So players can earn more than players earned in, in Provo, for example. Interesting. But it directly correlates to the impact that they can have. So the size mm-hmm. of their following. And then what happens is they can sell sponsors against their uniform and we'll print logos on their uniforms as part wow. of what That's they can cool. do. And we also hire them for uh, league-wide sponsors, sponsorships as well. So we'll do like campaigns through their social. We'll hire them for photo shoots, things like that. So we do have players that make substantial sums for that, but it, it directly correlates to the value that they create as well. And that's the big difference because, you know, if you evenly pay the entire league, um, the total sum of that increases yeah. dramatically. But yeah. if you're if you're equally uh, compensated for the value that you create, it's always sustainable because that means the value is out ahead of what's being paid, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, mm-hmm. actually. It's a merit-based, uh, merit-based system. Right, exactly. And, and like even, even some of the smaller sports that are quote-unquote professional do the exact same thing. Interesting. When it comes to like, you know, some they'll have salaries for certain players, but it directly correlates to both their impact on team play, but also their promotion, their how much they affect the team uh, awareness and, and fan base, uh, you know, interaction, things like that. So mm-hmm. we kind of took that approach. Uh, where do you guys do your events? Uh, your and how many do you do? How much? Do, how many does each team do a, a season? Currently, there's four regular season matches and then a playoff and championship uh, for the top teams that make it through the seeding process in the regular season. Where do those team matches happen? So currently, the vast majority of them are at uh, uh, fitness expos. Okay. Uh, so we okay. just. We just did an event at Mr. Olympia, which is oh, yeah. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, that ass. Yeah. yeah, so that we that'll be that'll be our second year with them. Um, we've got good relationships with a couple of others that continuously run events in Florida, and we've had a ton of expos reach out across the country about us coming to them because there's it's a no brainer for them. It's yeah. high energy, exciting sport. You know, we draw a good crowd for that type of event. And, um, and so we have lots of opportunities as that, as far as that goes. Um, and it just really depends on, you know, there are, there are downfalls to expos as well. Um, but that currently has been what we've done for the most part. We did one of our events at the San Jose Jose, Jose, and it was, it was a big hit. It was, it was, it was outstanding. We had a few matches there too. Yeah. 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 I think we did a few matches there and you set up a low, you set up a low bleacher system Mm -hmm. around the, around the grid and it was, they were exciting. And then you big, you know, big, uh, backdrop. Mm-hmm. it's got to be one of the things that's got to be much cheaper and much more available is all of the media the print media that you do you know like the banners and all that mm-hmm. stuff that stuff is so much cheaper these days even getting shirts made yeah, now right. is so much cheaper than it used to be yeah I mean, you know i mean the banners man you can get so much cheaper but you can make a nice professional then in it and i think that was the other thing um we went big like we you know well we were madison square garden in the yeah. first year <laughs> And, and, uh, and then the, Di- uh, our Diablo's team, well, the, the San Francisco fire ended up going over to the Haas Haas Pavilion, Pavilion Berkeley. Yeah. that venue cost us $70,000. Yeah. Did we break their floors? Yeah, I think we did too. <laughs> that was the other thing. We had, that was the other thing that it's hard to it's yeah. hard to uh, facilitate yeah, people ended, dropping hundreds of pounds. Yeah, and we covered their, their we covered their basketball floor and we swore to them we wouldn't do it. And then we ended up doing it. 
Um, but that, I mean, those are the things you got to take into consideration yeah. in, in those big venues. And it was, it was incredibly expensive. It was fun as hell mm-hmm. again, yes. fun as hell. And we, and I remember just, you know, going out to UC Berkeley and just, you know, trying to knock it on fraternity doors, get, yeah. trying to get people buy tickets or we were giving away a lot of tickets. Yeah, I remember, I remember hanging race. out at one of their venue or one of their events they were doing for their students. Yeah. Just trying to get people to go, which, you know, that's what you do when you start yeah. so you start a professional sport. That's you like door to door. We grind it. <laughs> we grind it for three no years. Doubt. No yeah. doubt. Um, yeah, and I, I personally yeah. feel like that was one of the most valuable lessons that we learned mm-hmm. from the NPGL. Yes. Is there's limitations to the amount of fandom you can develop instantly. Right. And yeah. and we had kind of like a, a easy layup audience as we thought, which was CrossFit. But yes. even with that, there was a lot of uh, barriers that have to be overcome to understand how the sport works and mm. to not feel like you're cheating on CrossFit and all of these things that, um, you know, don't just mean that they're automatically going to become fans. So the healthy respect for the process that it takes to develop fandom is one of the things that we really learned in that experience. Yes. have kind of recalibrated our expectations accordingly. The, we, one of the things I learned through the process was the uh, U S soccer, which still has teams go bankrupt to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, the U S soccer, and I watched the, the Beckham one, watch that one, the, by the way, his show. And he talks cause he acquired a the team in Miami and really went, he went big time on that, but he leveraged obviously his fame and notoriety to, to help yep. do that. But even they struggle with a lot of stuff and, and so there's, but the, but what I learned was, is that the soc- soccer in the U S really wasn't profitable at all for the first 20 years. And it was and what they needed was, and what they did was support youth soccer leagues. Yeah. So all of these youth soccer leagues during that 20 year period of time were built and, and set up and schools started playing more soccer. And all of a sudden now you've essentially created a fan base that mm-hmm. grew up playing soccer for 15, 20 years. Now they are your fans. Mm-hmm. Yep. Finally, UFC wasn't overnight either. You know, it went bank. Well, it was near bankruptcy when Dana White bought it. Right. Right. And then right. he, you know, and then and primarily because they couldn't get out most states, it was illegal. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. you know, he put up the money to help fight some of these, change some of these laws so that they could actually host utilize the venues. Yeah. In well, states. yeah. And in the different States and yeah. then, you know, and then set up the pay-per-view stuff and, and was able to break through, but it was huge investment. Now it's obviously quite successful. It's interesting. You made the commentary about it, the athletes getting paid. Mm-hmm. So, oh, there's a lot of multi-billion see. dollar company and athletes still feel cheated out of what, what they get. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I, my, the guy that did the tattoo on my arm was a, a you know, a, a UFC fighter, a MMA fighter, and you know he said I'd make a, you know, a few hundred bucks for a few matches. Exactly. So, I mean, exactly. Was, yeah. And I it's, think there's a legitimate reason for that. Unfortunately, there's also a legitimate yes. reason why CrossFit judges don't get paid. Yeah. And, and we do pay our referees. We have a lot lower quantity of them, mm-hmm. but people always harp on these types of decisions. But if you look across other sports. There's a reason they're volunteer driven because that cost is not sustainable. Mm-hmm. And, and you look at like uh, marathons, marathons are not paid staffs. They're all volunteers, like 70, 80 percent. Oh, are Ironman too. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a reason too. Yeah. There is a reason. <laughs> yep. Yeah. The, um, the one of the things that you alluded to, um, you glossed over, but I'll dig into it a little more. <laughs> Was Tony had a this expectation that the CrossFit community was going to buy into this? He had yeah. this built-in yeah. fan base of you know millions of CrossFitters. Functional fitness. Be, yeah, this is going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. And what he didn't um, anticipate was the blowback he would get from CrossFit enthusiasts, especially the top influencers, who said, "No, this is not CrossFit, and this is kind of cheating on CrossFit, and it's not the spirit of CrossFit." And then CrossFit also told their since we were hiring the athletes as employees, CrossFit forbade their red shirts, mm-hmm. the ones that are teaching all the certifications, from being hired by the National Pro Grid League. They perceived it as a competitive threat. Conflict. Yeah. I, conflict of I understand it. Um, I don't agree with it because we're on a team that had you know, a couple, well, of, couple of athletes that... It's completely different. 
Yeah. Well, and I understand. I mean, we all we understand. <laughs> we understand. Yeah. We understand the reasons. Yeah. Um, but we had a you know a num- number of teams, the teams that we thought were going to be great athletes, ended up not mm-hmm. signing on board because they were going to lose their um, their standing within CrossFit. Even athletes that were games athletes felt threatened by um, the loss of potential relationship with CrossFit. Mm-hmm. And that made it very, very difficult. And then, it, it, as you know, the fans, a lot of the fans took sides. Some were like, okay, with grid. And some were like, no, yeah. no way am I ever going to support that sport. Yeah. That, yeah that, I, that was an unforeseen challenge yeah. that we did not expect. And I think it was a small percentage of CrossFit fans that openly uh, accepted grid league, like some yeah. kind of. Uh, resisted a little bit, but when you have your favorite athletes out there, clearly, you know, staying away from it for, you know, what, who knows what reason, but whatever that reason is, is going to translate to the people that they, that care about them, you know? So, um, and you know, that is so far in the past. And I think if you explain the logic behind it, you know, 95% of people are going to agree that they're not competitive in any way and that it was kind of probably cost both sports a lot to create that competition. However, there are still remnants of that today. Now, the leadership. That's what I was going to ask you. Is there? Yeah, 100%. I mean, CrossFit, the leadership today has I've had conversations with them. They're very supportive. Like we've been open about our support of CrossFit. Like I'm still a CrossFitter. I identify as a CrossFitter. All, 90% of your athletes go to CrossFit gyms, right? I yeah. Mean. Well, actually the percentage has decreased significantly, but I would still say the majority. So 60, 70% yeah. still are uh, CrossFitters. And there is a very healthy coexistence. When somebody wants to play grid league, and they've never snatched before. They've never done, you know, a muscle up before. We send them to a CrossFit gym. There's just too yeah. much, that, you know, correlation that that makes too much sense for one another. And we've explained that to CrossFit. They've been very healthy conversation wise regarding that. Obviously, they have bigger problems right now. Um, but we've even had conversations about hosting a grid league match at, you know, a major CrossFit event, whether it be a semifinal or the games. Um, and that was going to be a topic of discussion heading into this year doesn't look like it's going to be now, but um, I think that's the way it always should have been. Now you listen to people that, uh, you know, have been around through the whole thing. They still have this kind of like subconscious resistance to the concept of grid. And there are other reasons than the fact that, uh, you know, CrossFit HQ resisted grid league. But I think even the reasons that have nothing to do with it, a lot of which are, you know, still kind of associated in some ways. So like, uh, the the biggest example is people assume that grid league is dangerous because you see backward mm-hmm. rolls, you see back uprise, um, you see higher, more complex elements performed by the athletes. And you're like, well, if CrossFit's dangerous, then grid league must be really dangerous because they're that much more difficult, that much more crazy to do. And, um, you know, the main difference is CrossFit is a training methodology. It's a, it's a lifestyle. It's it's selling to the masses as this is good for you to do. Whereas Grid League is not. Grid mm-hmm. League is essentially like, uh, you know, the NFL. Like the average person shouldn't go out on an NFL field and, you know, line up against linebackers and mm-hmm. take a hit. Um, and same thing with Grid League. Like if, if, you, if you got at the top of the rings and said, I'm going to do a butterfly muscle up and having never done a muscle up before, you're not going to attempt it. Like it, it's way out of the realm of anybody that, you know, is just average on the street, but, but separating the two is not easy for to do, you know, CrossFitters to do. Cause they're like, Oh, it should be functional. It should have a purpose in training. Our elements are not designed for that whatsoever. And so that kind of like conflict there cre- also creates some resistance to grid league a little bit. But again, I think the, the core, the basis of that is just remnants left over from past, you know, experiences. Well said. That makes sense. It is, um, it is a sport in and of itself unique and it is, you know, not, not to make comparison, but I, you know, I have lots, I have quite a few of our members that love to do Spartan races. They love to do high rocks. High rocks yeah. They're doing DECA races. I have marathoners. I have mm-hmm. people that do, you know, the mountain bike racing. Those are the ones that are getting injured. Actually, the ones that are getting injured are the, the two balls. most two most two most recent injuries in my gym. They're the most debilitating injuries we've had in our gym recently were pickleball. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, fantasy or uh, uh, flag football. I remember when I played flag yes. football, like I would have people limping off the field every freaking week, and we'd always be finding replacements. Like flag football was the most detrimental injury. Sport it is, ever. I, I think the fear is crossed is because it's it, there's so many crossfitters, and because some of the movements are also movements that are found in CrossFit that yeah. people may too too closely correlate them. But I I disagree completely, and I love the, the elements. Here's what I, again, what I love and why I think it's, um, and it, and I will tell you right now, it is, it, you know, CrossFit is a, the CrossFit, the sport and CrossFit, the games is a test of fitness. Mm -hmm. Who is the fittest on earth? Yep. Um, but the, on the team side of it, I love grid much more than the team side of CrossFit. CrossFit puts it as they want to test the, they want to find the weak link mm -hmm. in your team through tests of fitness, which they all participate grid is a strategy how do i best use my what what tools i have in my fitness tools i have in my toolbox the gymnastics person mm -hmm. the person that can do the heavy lift the the girl that can do that she's ripping fast handstand walks courtney cox courtney uh, courtney walker sorry courtney cox some friends courtney walker <laughs> <laughs> Courtney Walker on the part, which is like, like, how can we use those people effectively and mid race, like substitute them in yeah. and out to execute the workload that needs to be done. Yeah. And so there's a lot more strategy involved and it has made, and they're it just so incredibly fun to watch. It keeps you engaged. And I will argue for it for a CrossFit benefit. You watch one of those things and you leave there going, I, I, I want to, I want to go work out. Like, 100%, 100%. it is so inspiring yeah. to see it'll get you amped oh yeah to see you know sam dancer come down to the fourth quadrant and hit that clean and that that you know the hang squat clean or something it's just like holy crap or the other one was the burpee to the ring oh like that was a yeah. that was a deal breaker for some matches. all right so yeah so, yeah sorry i didn't want to go off on these tangents but there, <laughs> the one event that we had that was surprisingly good there's one there's actually two that i'll tell you that i'll think are surprising you and matter you tell me if you got some and oh i got some i got some with you too craig that okay one. good <laughs> <All right. laughs> so one of them with the jamie just mentioned what tell, tell, tell so us about it was the burpee a, to the it ring. was a burpee to a 10 foot ring yes Yep. So you basically had to do a burpee and jump up and hit the 10 foot ring, but you needed to have somebody tall enough that had enough hops to get it. Yep. Unfortunately, San Francisco fire did not have a very <laughs> tall person. So buddy Hitchcock was that guy. Yeah. He was so explosive, but it was so fun to watch him go up against like the really tall, athlete. the really tall guys and still like come out on top. Uh and again, because so it's could, maybe a bad touch and the yeah. ring's now swinging. And, he, and what's cool is as, a, as, a, as an athlete or as a fan, you can see the yes. ring getting touched. Like, you know when it's going to yeah. touch, but also you got the score thing going. Which shows and they would, you're up ahead. And there was times when athletes would miss multiple times yes. in a row and the other team would catch up. Oh, jumping to a ring became like a crowd yeah. cheering moment. It was really incredible. And the other one that really surprised me was the 14 foot or 15 foot wall balls. 15, mm. 15 foot wall balls. Yeah, we did 15 foot wall balls. I like that one. That was fun. And it was to a target that was kind of out and set away. It wasn't against yeah. the wall. So it was like an independent try. And watching people try to do the 15 foot when the you, air balls. When you have trained for years and years doing 10 foot wall balls, and all of a sudden you got to do a 15 foot <laughs> wall ball. Holy crap. It, that was another cool yeah. one. That was just like, what? Yeah, yeah the bur Burpee to Ring Touch is an essential classic element of oh, that's cool. and it still happens we had a championship decided no on a wow. to ring touch no. in 2022 the 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 sprint it came down to the sprint oh, relay oh my god teams were neck and neck going into the um the burpee to ring touch and oh, my one god. team missed it twice and that was it that was oh, it oh that poor <laughs> athlete that oh, it was rough but Dude, i mean like that that is the sport like yeah. that is Yes. And the, yeah. let me tell you what, if anyone's watching, this, there were tears like there. There are really emotional moments on TV. I have never seen a sport that draws emotion. Like yes. This. It is well insane. Said. Like, yes. good emotion. Yeah. And bad. And yep. immediately, too, because the race is so fast. Yes. 
Yeah, and that's honestly the hardest part about being the league and being the organizer. I much prefer owning a team. <laughs> 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 but uh, but like the amount of emotion that comes out from yeah, just being involved yeah. with this sport is like sometimes it's unmanageable for people. Like they yeah. cannot handle the emotion that comes from it. Yeah, I remember that. I'm nervous again. You know, when you think about that, by the way, just going back to that Burpee Arena, we said a championship. Was championship yeah. championship two missed ring touches that's like um the a, a 25 yard field goal in the super bowl that a kicker has done repeatedly multiple times perfect analogy and misses that kick yeah so i, it was I crazy. guarantee, you, I guarantee you that athlete is still living with those two missed ring touches right he, now. he doesn't play anymore unfortunately uh, um, because i think it was that hard on him yeah but the crazy thing was was like he was was one of the better at the league in the league at it, he came and he jumped down to touch his chest too far away from the ring. So when he jumped uh, up to go touch it, he was, he was out of place. Just out of reach of it. Uh, just out of reach of it. And that was like the the only mistake that he made. Um, but then of course like he missed the first one so it got in his head and like and, and then it was just oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. man they're rough. Yeah. I mean, hey, you guys, it, uh, anyone that listens or listens to this later on, because there's a lot of people who are going to replay this. Um, like, I have a, I have PTSD a little bit right now listening to this because it's just like you know, you, you James, we've you had know? a couple of those, we've had a match like that. Yes, yeah. yeah, and it's just it's like the you're as a fan or someone that's on the team, the emotions are so freaking high. And you're like, yeah. we got this, we've got the best ring toucher in the league, mm-hmm. and then that individual goes out there, they're nervous, and they end up coming down. They go a little bit faster than they probably should go. The crowds yell, the crowd, and the crowd gets loud in that fourth quadrant. Oh man. In those kinds of moments, the electricity yeah. and the emotion that's being poured out of the room is like unmatched. It, it feels like a stadium full of people yeah. in like a small area, just like completely into it, freaking the hell out all at the same time. It's like if you could capture that energy and share that energy, that would change people's perception on what the sport is essentially could be about. 100%. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm just thinking. Like, because remember, we yeah. had so many of those moments, so this many times. This is it. This is like people need to see this. Yes. And I and I will argue again and again, like especially where CrossFit is today with the sport. Mm-hmm. You want to you want to get people excited again about sport. Look, and and the fittest on earth. That's great. That's the that's the place where you test the fittest on earth, mm-hmm. and that's awesome. But man, you want people to get excited about human performance and watching human performance, uh, you know, at its finest in direct, direct, direct head to head competition, oftentimes men versus women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've really leaned into that. That's one of the things that uh, I have and Ruby, my, my partner, we've differed on with Tony a little bit on vision, I think. Mm-hmm. is how important that is yeah and he always said it was important but i really believe uh, it's that that's it's become more important it's yeah because i think that's the direction of society because i yeah. you know women's sports are getting more and more popular yes and uh you know there's definitely been kind of like a far too uh you know on the men's side of popularity and it's going to swing the other way yes and what's better than a single gender sport is putting them together mm-hmm. and it's yeah. just it just makes so much sense in a lot of ways. The only thing it doesn't make sense is it in is how we've always done things. And that's not necessarily mm-hmm. a good reason. So that's one thing we really leaned into. We, we create these opportunities for men to compete directly with and uh, against one another. Um, and of course, some of those are the most viral clips that we get on social media. Because that's, it is so different. And that those are like primarily like the, what you did different with the mirror races is making that essentially the men and women competing with each other, just changing and maybe the, the load on the bar or the movement on the bar because of the load. Yeah. So the, the echo is one, one good example, but another mm. really important one, well, there's actually two. Mm. Um, one is in the ringer point race that I mentioned earlier, there's mm. a male and a female version. Mm. So a lot of times it's the same. So if it's a body weight element, it'll be the same exact same race. But if it's a barbell element, there'll be two separate weights. Mm. And we just over time understand what weights create the closest outcomes amongst the top performers and assign the different weights. But a team can choose either. So they pick yeah. either a male or female that they think is going to give them the best chance to win. So we have men versus women in those runner points all the time. That's cool. 
man. And, and then, the other one, the other one, Craig, you love this one. Yes. Um, so one of the other icons of the sport that you mentioned earlier is Taylor Songs. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And she plays now. And um, yeah, that, so, now. by the way, I see. And that makes me so when I see like Erica yeah. Donna and Taylor, yeah. Stone, it's, yeah. it makes me so happy because these guys were just by the way. And, and so Taylor was the strong woman on the D.C. Brawlers mm-hmm. and the closer. And, and I love and hate her <laughs> because <laughs> so she, true. right. I mean, she was so just, true. You like you knew if there's gonna be a heavy lift at the end, like you're just gonna get we're gonna get not even a heavy in. lift. It could be a moderate well, barbell. Yeah, she's just so bleep, 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 bleep. fast, so, so fast. fast and so yeah. strong. Yeah, and she was an icon in the league. She was just like she was. Uh, did she get league MVP? Yeah, she did. oh for yeah. sure. Yeah, and now so she, let's, and she's you still, gotta let me tell this story <laughs> about her. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I built it up a little bit for you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is great. So. uh one of the things that we did to create this opportunity for men and women to compete directly with one another is the last element in the sprint relay. Mm-hmm. We made it so that uh, it was a version that a really strong female could perform and give a team a benefit if that's the case in the design of the rest of the elements. And so you're incentivized as a team to have a female do it if you have somebody that can. Mm. Not every team does. Right. And so you end up with circumstances where a male will go against a female. So last year we had uh, Taylor Stallings on the aces versus the lions who have, are the most winningest team in the league. It came down to a gridlock with that version of sprint relay. It was Taylor Stallings versus a guy. They ran down the grid. He was slightly behind her. She did it as fast as him. It was two cleaning jerks of two, 205 pounds. She did it as fast as him ran back and won the entire match on that element beating him at the same element. Now, of course, he was a little bit behind, but, I mean, you can imagine how hyped that he was. held off, yeah. And was the, is the weight the same for him as her? Yeah, it was the same weight. That's oh, amazing. my God. Such a beast. Yeah. She, God damn her. But that makes that makes it so That's fun like, to watch, Oh, though. my God, it's so fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. That would have been awesome. And that's that was like one of those iconic moments that will go down in the history because it was yeah. a, first of all like, we've only had a few gridlocks and to have a gridlock finish in that way yeah, was awesome, just yeah. so amazing. Uh, that's so so, so cool. It's you know it, you know in a podcast like this it's hard to get people excited. I you know I can't encourage you enough. Well, let me ask you this: so to 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 watch it to if you can go to yeah. go to it. I, I want to talk to you. Do you have? Do you still have time here? Where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, good. Because I want to talk to you about. Um, you, how your what your season looks like how we can watch your season and then what i also want to talk about is there a way that athletes can participate and then the last thing is is what are your thoughts on expansion of the league yeah so uh man so you you we live stream all of our matches on youtube that's okay. one way to watch mm-hmm. um, when is your when is your season so we just finished our regular season and we our playoff and championship is november 16th okay so you can you can watch a uh, live stream then. And I got to throw in there that, you know, we had a Hurricane Milton during our last event and it really screwed up uh, the last, you know, uh, event at Mr. Olympia. So we're having two makeup matches for teams that couldn't make it to the event um, prior to the playoffs and championship at that event. So it's going to be a crazy event to see a lot more action than you would typically. Yeah. Um, so watching that on live on YouTube is going to be the best way to kind of keep up with it. Um, as Craig said earlier, there is no replacement for being at a match. And that's true of a lot of sports, but um, that for sure. And, you know, when it comes to growing the league, there's been a couple of different thought processes about how to best do it for grid league. Uh, initially, when we started the Florida grid league, we were thinking that participation was going to be it. Uh, mm-hmm. So just like soccer, who invested in a participation early on, developed in the play uh, fandom, we, we started a kids grid league. It did really well, created a lot of passion. We have kids that still come to matches. We have kids that grew up to play in the league now that are uh, performers in the league. Um, and so it worked. However, the time, effort, organization, manpower mm-hmm. it took didn't equate to, you know, what needed to be happen for it to be sustainable and and what we found was more sustainable and also uh you know kind of scaled better was the media so like short form showing the athleticism of them Mm -hmm. those going viral 
getting interest and then directing them to the live stream is how we've been able to grow with largely unknown players. Like we've had a couple of players that have gone to the games. Um, mm. I think only one or two have gone individually, but, um, but you know, when you come to a match or when you participate, it's a, it's a much deeper connection that you develop with the sport. So mm. we're trying to create opportunities for people to play. And we have a new plan to roll that out uh, this year to kind of really lower the barrier of entry to be able to play. So it can be in gym based. And, and I feel like that'll mm. hopefully help get people to understand the sport more, but also another big initiative is to create more, uh, I guess, fandom, to the players directly because mm -hmm. I think the big barrier now that, you know, we've proven the sport is engaging. We've had, you know, we, we get hundreds of thousands of views on our live streams on YouTube, which is great. Um, but getting that hardcore fandom that will travel to come to an event will, you know, spend money on the, the swag for the team and will follow really closely is kind of the next stage of mm -hmm. things. It's kind of like that 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 area of where soccer was before the you know young soccer players grew up, or where UFC was before right. Dana White took over. We've proven we have a product. It's just a matter of developing the real deep fandom that um, creates to like following deeply all season long. So um, there's a lot of different ways that we think we can work on developing that, but one of them is to get into more regions and have more teams because that, you know, creates more reasons to follow and, and more reasons to feel that tension and competitiveness with other teams. And so, uh, you know, given the fact that most of the teams are in Florida now that reduces the regional impact mm -hmm. significantly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're adding two teams before the 2025 season. Oh, okay. We, we've just announced our first, which is Houston, Texas. And, um, and that's, going to spread out the regionality of it a little bit and, mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully help support people being vested in the single team's performance throughout the season. Um, and so we're, we're in talks with a few other people about the potential second team um, in Northern California is a really great uh, place for it. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, here we, and here we go. That's <laughs> seed. <laughs> But um, so like currently this, the main strategies are adding teams. And, and I think our goal is to add two every year, um, okay. at least for the foreseeable future. We'll slow it down if we need to. There are challenges every time you add a team as far as logistics and communication and all of those things. Um, but we're adding two for the 2025 season. Our goal is to add two more for the 2026 season and kind of continue to grow it that way. One of our objectives all along has been to grow at a sustainable pace. So not get out of uh, in front of our skis and, you know, do things, probably add a little bit less than we mm -hmm. feel like we could just so that we keep it manageable and keep it, um, you know, sustainable. Um, so that's kind of like the general thought process. And then that additional opportunity for gyms to be able to play the sport in their own gym is something we're going to roll out in this off season. And I think okay. has some potential, but it's one of those things that, you know, is going to take some testing and trial and yeah. error that and take some time to develop too. I think we'd like to be a part of that. That'd be fun. And Jamie and I have talked about that. Yeah. It's doing a, doing a, a grid match here. I Just mean, and, and not even well, one to give the athletes the exposure to it. But what I want to do is I really want to give my community. Cause I think our community would love to watch it. Well, especially some of our community that's been around since the right. national program. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They would yeah. love, they'd love to see it and they'd love to see just even at a local gym event yeah. versus maybe another, another gym. Yeah. Yeah. We've had gym versus gym matches and the turnout, the emotion, the excitement, yeah. the investment in everybody from the gym in their own team. And the most valuable, I think, from a gym perspective is. You know, because teams have a wide range of ability on them, you have kind of your like fire breather athletes that have mm -hmm. their roles, but then you also have more general athletes that, you know, are part of these teams that also contribute and it, it, it connects the dots. So you break down clicks within gyms, you really build the community within gyms. And of course, that's really one of the big objectives as, as a gym owner is how do you build community within a gym? Mm -hmm. So the gym rallies around the team and, uh, you know, gets excited for it. And it, it really is. A, sure. in, in, awesome experience and uh you know there's a ton of benefits and potential outside of just playing the sport 
Oh yeah, mm-hmm. we a lot of our members would come to the fire matches. Oh yeah, they were you know they were, our members were the, all of our volunteers that did all the work, <laughs> rolling out the barbells. <laughs> it's true, tra- traveling with the team the whole nine yards. Yeah. It was it, it was awesome, and there was no never like any. Well, this isn't CrossFit. Like we never had ever any of that. It was this is fun. It was this is fun this, to be a part it, of, and that's and that's one thing I'd really like to and and I'm gonna take this opportunity to uh, to talk to CrossFit about it um, because and I do have access um to to be able to do that is to to make them understand just how fun and engaging it was for the community Mm -hmm. and and we didn't i don't worry about anyone creating any confusion about what crossfit is versus what grit is like well, my, my our customers knew like, people that do crossfit know the difference mm-hmm. and they know what one is versus the other is and 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 there's like and there's it was never a threat to the open the semifinals or any of that it just matter of fact it kept and i'm looking at your season if you're in november you're in the off season yeah. what a great way to keep people engaged yeah. in sport mm-hmm. yeah um for what we do since there's not a whole lot no. Yeah, if high rocks can be in existence and yes. not represent it's, what CrossFit or Olympic weightlifting existed way before CrossFit did. Yeah. Of course, they had all these, you know, issues with CrossFit initially, but then of course embraced it because CrossFit blew Olympic weightlifting up. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. There's so many correlations that make sense. And the let's, same, you know, yeah, it, let's it, let's look at a high yeah. rocks wall ball versus a grid league wall ball. <laughs> right right there hey, let's look at the average depth of the athlete yeah. <laughs> first of all the grid league athlete is going to beat them and <laughs> we had the clicker at the, at the target before they did too yeah yeah we did That's and, right. and, That's and, right. and and grid league's got professional referees yeah yep Paid professional referees, referees. yeah and yeah there's some stuff that looks that that looks crazy. The burpee backflips like that looks crazy, but man, it just is a real measure of and the explosiveness, the coordination, the agility. You also mentioned, like you mentioned the, the, the officials, right? The yes. judges, right? We had professional judges. Yes. Imagine, imagine we had CrossFit judges as a profession where they have now stuff to do year round. Yeah. If it was oh, the yeah. games to then grid. So then oh. they can keep their, 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 uh, their skills sharp. Their skills sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I will say I that, about that the judging or refereeing for a grid league is way different. Than oh, CrossFit. it's so different. <laughs> but at least you have the advantage of, uh, you know, knowing what a squad is and what to look for. Exactly. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Man, that's that's uh, that's cool. What? Well, um, we're we are we're, we're gonna go pull out the the grid oh, mat man, that we I'm have upstairs. Like, dude, I was digging out. <laughs> uh, we were, you know, Jerry. Yeah, Jamie and I were preparing for this, and we we're just like, you know, I just got nostalgia, oh, so going nostalgic. up to stuff, looking at the old videos. I mean, I pulled the out the, the combine sweatshirt. The here. combine sweatshirt. <laughs> I went and dug up this Sapphire T-shirt. My, yeah. as I, I told these guys beforehand, this is my four hundred thousand dollar T-shirt <laughs> <laughs> and my two hundred fifty thousand dollar hat. <laughs> uh, but it makes me feel good to 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 that this is like i see your stuff and i'm so grateful to you and your sister for what you've done and keeping this going because it was it was so freaking amazing i have you know yes when i say i have ptsd but it's like ptsd in a really really positive way Mm -hmm. just so emotional you can't have something meaningful that's not difficult like that's what makes it meaningful yep that's what i mean yeah and and um and, and I want to I want to reflect that appreciation back to you because you've been one of the ones that has always you know touched base and said hey you guys are doing a great job saw this and so that, those kinds of things are so important to us and we really appreciate it and I know Ruby wished she could be a part of it and says hi mm-hmm. um but uh, but yeah I mean oh the one thing I wanted to mention yes so please this is a defining moment in the sport for me and and you were there craig and i wanted to touch on this story it was the vegas and it made me think about it because we went back to vegas uh it was the vegas combine where they had the super teams that kind of uh was it north first south or east first west or something yes and i was sitting next to you watching that match and it was one of those matches that came down to the sprint relay came down to the last element and we're going nuts in the stands and everything and and just the commentary from you after that was like, that was the best sporting experience yeah. I've ever had in my life. You said that to me, yeah. that became our mission. 
is the best sporting experience on the planet. Um, and so, you know, that like that moment is one that I'll always remember because it left an imprint on like the the mechanics of the sport working really well and mm -hmm. better than we ever envisioned. Yeah. And the mechanics is only one part of it, but it's an important part. And that was like that was one of the moments to define it that I'll always remember for me as like, oh, this is something that can be really important mm -hmm. in the world. That's fantastic. Awesome. I think it's it represents an opportunity too to get more people engaged in movement. A hundred percent. That's a huge part of our values. There's so many reasons to sit on the couch now, especially yeah. with like uh, you know video games and things and, and, yep. and uh, you know, artificial intelligence doing a lot of the stuff for us, the more reasons we can have to exhibit what our bodies can do, the better. And, um, I like and, and it's so scalable to every level mm -hmm. too. Absolutely. And, and, and there's somebody for everybody on a grid league team. So everybody has somebody to look up to that, that has characteristics that remind them of themselves. It could be a big giant weightlifter. It could be a tiny little gymnast and everywhere in between. And that is missing in sports, but it's also so important about sports and what makes it so inspiring. Like you said, Craig, it makes you want to go work out because you see somebody that looks a little bit like you or has characteristics like you doing something incredibly amazing. And it just makes you want to, you know, go out there and do something too. <laughs> that's so, that's so well said again, just like all of this stuff is just great. I, it, I'm, I'm highly inspired to be a pain in the ass to CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I, you know, I've, uh, the one beauty of being like 61 years old is I kind of don't give a fuck. <laughs> um, and, and two, I've been, been doing this Diablo thing for 18 years now um and been a part of, of every level of crossfit from the sport to this to to be able to have some influence have a voice until they tell me to shut the fuck up or go away and so i'm gonna i'm gonna leverage that opportunity to help um draw some attention to you guys and what you're doing in the sport because i think it will uh, completely engage mm -hmm. Our community, and yeah. you, you, rather you remember too. People would come, skepticals. I remember the Haas oh, Pavilion, yeah. and people were just like, hmm, "I'm gonna go see what this is all about." Mm -hmm. And then they would, and then after we're like, "That was and unbelievable!" Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, adrenaline flying, <laughs> adrenaline flying, and like it, you, it, all you had to do was I knew I was like, I'd get them in, yeah. and get them in one match. Yeah. Go see one match. You could even see like one race in one match, and you get them. Yeah, and they get it. And they don't think, oh, this is going to replace CrossFit. No, no. <laughs> absolutely. No, it's, they coexist very well together. Very well. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like they support one another. 100%. Yeah. Well, so, and, and just, I guess this would be a great kind of closing conversation and kind of what prompted this, uh, this, this podcast as well as we saw a little bit of grid overlap. We've seen in the past. Oh, we, saw yeah. we used to see hints of it at the games, the ladders at the games, those kinds of things that would show up after we like, Hey, they're copying us. But at Wadapalooza, Wadapalooza, Miami and, uh, North SoCal. Yeah. SoCal. Yeah. There was a lot of similarities there. A lot of similarities for sure. I mean, there was clear inspiration, which I, I find flattering and yeah. sure, I think yeah. it's great. And, um, you know, the ringer point that I described was they had an exact format like that. They had the triad, um, okay. you know, th three and three going out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's awesome. I mean, you know, we actually got a lot of attention from that because people debated, you know, was it, was yes, it taken was from, it, was yeah. it appreciated? Was it, you know, and then of course we had the opportunity to talk a little bit about what makes grid even better because honestly mm -hmm. it was well received. A lot of people, I saw a lot yes. of great comments about it and people said it was yeah. fun to watch. They did. Um, and grid from a spectator perspective, purely, if you're not talking about defining who's the fittest is better. It's hard to argue that it's not. The only thing that we didn't have uh, that Wadapalooza had is the best crossers in the world mm -hmm. being a part of it. And that's the main difference. Yep. The, the uh, Let me just say this, because I've been to every single CrossFit Games. Maybe just one I haven't been to, but I think every single CrossFit Games, and especially in the last five years, uh, because Diablo hasn't had a team there. Mm -hmm. But I would go, you'd go and you'd watch individual athletes and you watch the teams. The stadium would empty out, except for family yep. and friends yep. mm -hmm. that would watch the heat mm -hmm. 
of like their team. They even watch, wouldn't watch the others. And the events were, and they did what they, you know, again, they were testing the fitness of the team. Yeah. yeah. But there was, there was like no rivalry, no like just passionate excitement, no like, oh my God, they're going to pass them. Like there was very, very little of that because it was a different um, type of event. And I really think it's, it's a, the, the team competition as it stands today is a bit of a disservice to the sport mm -hmm. because it's not engaging the fans. And it may be, per, you know, it's look, it's probably, a, I know it's a blast for the athletes and mm -hmm. it's a big accomplishment oh, yeah. to make it to the, it it's a huge accomplishment to be there, um, especially given the, the level of competition today in CrossFit. Um, but it doesn't, it's not helping the sport. Mm -hmm because it's not pulling in eyeballs it's not getting people engaged and the and the teams that are there a lot of them are pro teams meaning they come from different gyms so the affiliates aren't engaged yeah. in it and we know that there's an issue there with affiliates that are like you know I, it's not even affiliate teams these are just you know these are pro teams right and then um it, the, then also no one is inspired to want to participate do and yeah. do it and and here's an opportunity maybe to to in, in, to pull in or partner with or what the you know and I've always said this CrossFit should just sponsor be a sponsor of mm -hmm. the Grid League. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, we we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give these guys funds to let them develop this sport because we want to promote CrossFit to all of these people yeah. that are watching this. It's Here, another reason to CrossFit. Yes, yeah, it's, yes, exactly. it's another reason to CrossFit. Yeah, and 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 celebrate that sport and maybe be an exhibition at the at, at the crossfit games i, I, I think it makes so much right. sense it's not like there's any direct competition whatsoever it brings another reason no. to pay attention and it widens the range of athlete types that are benefiting from crossfit so you mm -hmm. have your big giant weightlifters, you have your small little gymnasts and everyone in between that have some connection back to CrossFit and it just widens the range of opportunity to bring more attention to what CrossFit is. When I was yeah. down at the Wadapalooza in Miami, I went for the first time ever this year and I thought, man, what a great opportunity. Like th it's a fitness festival, really cool. There was a, you know, the CrossFit event going on at the same time. I think, man, High Rocks could run an event here mm -hmm. at Wadapalooza. What a great way to bring in that crowd. I wonder if grid they, could yeah, do that. Well, and grid could do yeah. that, right? Less At, footprint too, right? And less less footprint. But he, like, why not? Like, why not? Yeah. We, we have this. It would be we similar. Have a, we have sixty percent of the population that is morbidly obese right now. Yeah. <laughs> why not make all of this like the the way to get people in and start mm -hmm. moving? Yeah, in a really cool way. Yeah. Anytime we can celebrate athleticism, you know developing physical ability i think it doesn't matter what form that takes it's a positive thing for society that's right mm -hmm. and if you want to test your fitness overall and find out if you're the fittest in the world do crossfit yeah. uh, the sport that's right that's yep right. and if you have a specialty or if you have certain elements yes. that you're really good at you still have an opportunity to compete at a really high level yes sir yeah yes sir because there are those athletes absolutely exactly yep Right on, dude. This was a great conversation. Yeah. We got a lot of thanks for coming on. Yeah, really appreciate it. Please say hello to Ruby. We won't snub her next time. We'll bring her on. She's even better. <laughs> I, agree. I agree. And uh, and it'd be it'd be fun to say hello to her too. But I we'll, we'll uh, we're we'll, gonna go dust the the dust the yeah dust off the dust from the mats. Yeah, Wipe this off is the dust this the mats. is this is not the end of this conversation. No, please. Anytime you guys want to talk about something, let me know. I'm I love these conversations, and you're gonna be one of the first people we talk to about you know this in gym thing that we're going to be working on in the off season. It's awesome. Good. I'm going to help you promote November 16th too. I'm doing an event here at Diablo mm -hmm. with, uh, with all of the affiliates. I got a bunch of affiliates coming in for a gathering here at Diablo on November 16th. So what I, I probably may not be able to tune in live depending upon the hours, but I am going to promote it heavily yeah. to everybody that comes to it. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank yep. you so much for that. Really appreciate yep. it. And thank you guys for having me on. It was, this was awesome. Cool. I'm glad you enjoyed it, man. Yeah. Thank you. It'll be available on Spotify and Apple podcasts probably at the end of the day. Okay. Sweet. Right, I will, we will be promoting it for sure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. It was a blast. Man.